decision on a mix and imagine trying to hear a mix in like a, a temp like this <laughs> it's too bright it's like yeah no shit <laughs> it's the tent <laughs> uh, we should come up jam okay. i think you're scared <laughs> dude i'm fucking scared i ain't going back out there <laughs> one time's enough <laughs> You up there, I'll be the snare. If you have one that you march around in, is yeah, that yeah. It? <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll Don't be a little strap. <laughs> <laughs> one hour before we walk. Shit, Dude, you ready? Yeah. One hour before Damn, we walk. Damn, I'm not ready yet. Uh, I don't want to go on. I'm scared. <laughs> I mean, the thing about Hi guys, welcome to Layer of the Like and aka the HQ of Metal. Metal music to me is rebellion, expression, brutality, nonconformity, oneness, victory, and serenity. And this mini series will be looking at the best metal albums in the last 10 years. So, right, we're pretty much at the end of the decade. Now would be a good time as any to reflect on the era which has legitimately shown just how innovative and unique metal can be. While bands such as Metallica, Megadeth, released albums which showed them keeping up with their contemporary counterparts with ease. You see, it was the scene's new blood which kept things truly interesting. We might have slipped out of the mainstream further than ever before, but all that means was that sub-genres from sub-genres were invented, existing ones completely redefined, and future classics unleashed onto the world with freedom and focus. So here goes. Signaling six minutes of absolute nonsense. The strong and overture it rattled Empath's touchiness. Meshuggah esque heaviness, spage A fret tapping, funky flights of fancy, clean interludes, electronic trickery, raw sound production, high honking or construction and importantly his hooks. Through that yes, Devin had leveled up. It was everything that but more. A lustic beat packed with lyrical letters that demanded commitment. Because throughout his career, Devin always appeared to our basic human truths, whether it be on a precious classes such as Ocean Machine and Terrier or SYL. He started ambient tangents of DTP's evolution. It came back to love, lost failure, and hope. His fetish for pro, his fetish for pro tools and excessive multi tracking didn't change that, because Empaths was. Devin Townsend's most comprehensive, overloan, eventually accomplished work to date. In fact, it was his masterpiece. Every band who dabbled in prog fringes th in this decade. The rumours that President Mazda's long awaited Emperor of Sound were that it was going to be their progiest yet. Shock horror. Imagine the relief when this record proved to be simply a masterpiece con of contemporary heavy music. While Precious well, previous Mastodon albums delve into stories of oceans, mountains, their seven conjured images of deserts and barren wastelands, danger, danger lurking just below the surface, telling the tale of a wanderer facing a death sentence, told by the band's own experiences with cancer in their immediate families. Ross Hand wasn't just a concept on paper, the musical within was powerful, defiant, and steeped in anguish, and showed the quartet their most vulnerable. Who's Sound had previously have been akin to that of a fiery monster. Emperor was not so much a beast bearing its teeth, but rather its wounds. And while Emperor was our most lyrically overt about the cruelty of cancer, the references to life and death throughout were dripping in metaphor. This was the music monster needed to write powerful, passionate, 
and performed by one of the most creative, ambitious bands in our world. The rambling highway of Show Yourself, the gigantic, gigantic guitars of Roots Remain, and the instant heaviness of clandestines, clan, clandestinely proved that Marston was still very much a metal band. Few, but the MVP on award on the track list went to Steam Breaver, backed by a cosmic down to groove. The bellowing chorus and heavyweight instru instrumentals fused together into a Herculean blast that airwormed its way to your brain and refused to leave for days. This is, however, were the real cornerstone of this album. From tales of falling into a pit of lies, saving yourself from the prophecy, you really realized that these were huge sweeping lines of life death and the joy of existence. It wasn't a happy record, but it was a defiant, emotionally raw, hugely resonant. Meaning life is the one thing we all have in common, but it took a band as special as Moston to put life into, into perspective. It's amazing what a difference of a bit of turmoil and resolution can do to create to the creative life of our very metal band. When Megadeth released Super Collider in 2013, the response was at best mixed, although nowhere near as bad as some critics made out. It was largely a pedestrian collection that boasted very little of the aggression and edginess that Megadeth fans tend to expect. But one of the things that has long defined Dave Mustaine's career has been his ability to confound the cynics with an opinion sneer, flex those genre refining muscles again. As a result, the fact that Dystopia was one of the finest records Megadeth had ever, ever made should have been less of a welcome, a welcome surprise than we should return to the natural order of things. March was made of the album's new lineup and the apparently new harmonious constitution. It was certainly true that Megadeth sounded like a well-ordered machine again, but with, but with respect to the musicians involved, Dystopia Opia's brilliance was rooted in the songs themselves and how they demonstrated that Megadeth had rediscovered the fire of finesse that made the likes of Rusty in Peace and Anger such master releases. There were plenty of technical twists, death changes of pace, and as a blistering showmanship on the Rooney's heart track and the epic menace of Poison Shadows, but there were also huge rising choruses that and riffs that demanded the banging of heads. Best of all, that online sense of rageful dis disquiet that had always set Megan apart was back in abundance. Sonically too, Dystopia suggested that Super Collider was one momentary take lapse of sanity. It sounded monstrous, favorably modern and precise but underpinned by several tons of that kind of oomph that emerges when several bands are in zone and high on passion. Invigorated by fresh blood and sounding more engaged and enraged than they had in decades. Megadeth were back on the very best neck wearing. The very seven folds courage couldn't be emphasized enough when they released Nightmare in 2010. It's not a stretch to say that the band's decision to soldier on through the adversity that befell them when the tragic passing of Jimmy the Rev Sullivan and to grab the bull by the horns and recorded and release a new album was first on the heroic. The first half of Nightmare saw the band reignite in the complex blood and thunder feel of 2005's album CEO Eve, Welcome to the Family, showcased A7's love of for SoCal punk rock with a metallica sized stomp. Buried the Love was part ballad, part arena ready metal anthem, and the soundtrack was a tour de force of quality rest and unshakable vocal lines. The second, the second half of the album, including the 11 minute Close to Save Me was understandably a somber affair. There was no way around it. The last three tracks were grueling due to their intensity and melancholic feel. But the therapeutic effect this had on the band was that came to be celebrated in future. The lyrics throughout Nightmare were so barely raw that as points straight up to Are You Uncomfortable? This can't be real. I've lost my power to feel on grew on the so so terms of victim. While so far away, Soul Shadows wondering, how do I live without the ones I love? It was when the emotion and lyrics collided like an uppercut to the throat that things really kicked up a notch. The, the piano breakdown in Danger Line generally sounded like Shadows could burst in, into tears at any moment he, as he sat, any second he sang, I never meant to leave this world alone, 
I thought that he grew old. A7 has continued as the band for a reason to band enough to applaud them in 2010. That they managed to create a body of work of art that still kicked as much ass as they, they always had these conditions. Should have been them rightly recognised as one of the best bands of their generation. Ramon was the ultimate tribute to a fallen friend. Nature and Nightwish Mute which is music has always been designed to challenge the metal status quo, whether it be through the progressive nuances of their Celtic influences or by injecting starting measures of bombast into everything they touch. 15. Things were no different. Floor Jackson had just come on board, but the news of their new recruit was somewhat eclipsed by the choice to eschew fantastic tons in favour of natural biology. With the inclusion of spoken word sections by geneticist and staunch atheist Professor Richard Dawkins. So, so far, so that wish. With the shadow before the beautiful, we met by a moment of underrated metallic rhetoric. The unknown, the great grand show, the choir of stars, chimed floor on a chorus that wrote of crashing waves or symphonic bravado and mashing weight by the massive shredding section, providing its climax. Sonic upheaval continued through weak fantasy with its death metal esque intro bursting like a nuclear explosion in a wash of operatic theatrics and mass of strings and brass and woodwind and charging triumphant melodies that interestingly hinted at Queen's Reich's Metallica soul. The album's closer, a 24 minute opus in the greatest show on earth was a defining moment here and at the point where which Richard, Moore, Richard Dawkins made his appearance by we have several interesting monologues. We are going to die and that makes us the lucky ones. He had, he uttered as the accelerating histrionics faded out into onto the sound of a well song. And the album concluded its successive tale of origin that upheld Nightwish's legacy as the masters of bomb blast and fair.